So my name is Philip Bullcock and I'm here to give you an overview of The Science of Acting. Stick around because there's a chance to win this book, The Science of Acting by Sam Cogan. Uh, this is a bit of a moth-eaten copy. Your one will be mint brand new. So stick around and uh, without further ado, let's, um, let's start. I'll introduce myself first. I'm an, an actor and a director. And um, I went to the National Youth Theatre of Great Britain. That's where I started my acting career. Um, a career, I mean, I, w I wasn't professional there. It was um, a summer school when I was 17. And then I uh, subsequently went to Mount View Theatre School and ended up going to the School of the Science of Acting. So I've been to two drama schools and the National Youth Theatre. Um, and the science of acting I, I went to after taking after Mount View, I, I spent ten years in the profession, and then I I went um, after that uh, ten years I went back to training and I trained uh, retrained in acting and directing at the School of the Science of Acting under Sam Cogan. Um, as an actor, I've done all kinds of work. I've done film, theatre, TV, um, radio plays, voice work. I've done everything, which has been great. But a really varied career, and that's um, that's how it should be, I think. Um, and now about Sam. Sam Cogan uh, taught me for four years. Um, he went to GITIS, which is the Russian Institute of Theatre Arts, for five years, and he studied under someone called Maria Knabel, a professor there. Um, it's a very famous school. It's one of the oldest drama school in the world. Stanislavski taught there. Stanislavski taught Maria Knabel. Maria Knabel taught Sam, and uh, I read an article last night. It's a big deal about you know how close you are in generations to Stanislavski, and there's a guy saying I'm fourth artistic generation, which means he was taught by someone, 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 he was taught by Stanislavski, I think. Anyway, Sam was taught by someone who was taught by Stanislavski, and I guess I was taught by Sam. He was taught by someone who was taught by Stanislavski. So if things like that matter to you, then that's great. And I mean, it does actually highlight the heritage of uh, the science of acting technique. I don't think there's another technique really um, that has its own school that has that kind of heritage. It, it's really um, a, a unique thing. Maria Knabel also, she worked with Stanislavski, so she studied under him and then she went on to, be, to work with him as well. Um, Sam and I met at Mount View Theatre School. He came in and there was a guest tutor there. The first lesson was interesting because um, I told him I thought it was a lot of BS. I was a, a very, I had a lot of attitude. I was a young, you know, 18, 19 year old, very obnoxious. Anyway, I went on to study extra classes with him after school hours had finished. Quite a few of the students did. And then as I say, I left Mount View and 10 years later, I went back to the School of Science of Acting to study with him full time for four years on the acting and directing course. It took him 20 years to develop the science of acting technique. It has its roots very firmly in uh, Stanislavski, but it, it's, it's, he's developed it to become a standalone technique. That's the, the kind of introduction. A lot of consternation, because it's called the science of acting, excuse me. Um, a lot of people didn't like it. And I was reading some of Sam's notes the other day, and he said, you know, people were really offended thought it was pretentious you know thought that you can't marry science and acting you know they're incompatible you can't have them together in the same uh, science and art sorry you can't have them together in the same phrase and um but one of his uh, one, a huge influence on sam um was leonardo da vinci and i mean you just got to think about leonardo da vinci and the fact that the guy was extremely analytical and very scientific in his approach to painting and his approach to to life he just had a real thirst for knowledge and kind of go well you know he's one of the greatest artists that ever lived I think that would be generally um, that would be the consensus of opinion so if that's the way he works it can't be all that bad so the, the same analytical approach that, that Leonardo da Vinci had towards his art Sam wanted to to have that same approach to um, acting training and understanding acting and training acting and directing training. Da Vinci has, has a quote, so I'll have to read this off my, my notes. It says, the most praiseworthy form of painting is one that most reflects what it imitates, which I guess you can say the same for acting, certainly what you would be aiming for. It's easy to see that in the physical world. It's easy to see when people are 
you know, it produced a painting if it represents what they're painting, you can say that's a very good painting. In the the acting world is a bit different because it's a it's you know it's not the physical realm, it's the mental realm. So things are a lot less tangible in, in the mental realm. So that creates a little bit of a, a a challenge. So, you know, considering that and the problem with drama training, because of course drama training it's all to do, it's in the mental realm. I'm just gonna take a bit of a detour and talk about um points of reference. This is the lens cap off my off my camera that I'm filming. You know, if I if I let go of this, you know, every time it's gonna fall into my other hand, you know, every time. And and gravity is a point of reference, it's something that proves to be true under constant testing. In the building industry or in architecture or in engineering, there are very clear points of reference. And if you don't obey them or you don't you don't stick to them then there can be disastrous results and you know, bridges fall down if you don't use the right angles to uh, to bear the load and if you don't build a brick wall using the points of reference um, that there are for building a brick wall then more than likely the brick wall is going to fall down and uh, but that that's again the physical world in the mental world it's a bit more challenging and is that a problem yeah it is a problem because of course when you're talking about acting and acting training if you don't have points of reference, what's it based on? It's based on people's opinions, and I'll come back to this. But if you see the, the teaser that I did for the for this uh, live stream, it's called a ratio rectangle, and it's it talks about opinions and being based on knowledge and personal feelings. I'll come back to it. I'm actually going to go to it and, and talk you through it later in the in the stream. Anyway, people's opinions uh, that's kind of what acting and acting training is kind of based on. And that's a problem because people's opinions vary. You know, as an actor, when I was studying, you know, early on in my um, studies, I definitely had times when, you know, from day to day, it seemed like the opinion was changing and I didn't understand why. I thought I was doing the same thing. You know, say it was a whatever piece, a monologue or whatever. Um, but the, the opinion might change and certainly other students, I saw that happen to them as well. And, and the problem that creates is it, it, the students uh, lose confidence very quickly because they don't really know what it is they're doing and don't have any idea of how to make it better or more consistent because everything's based on opinions. So that's, that makes it really tricky. Also, equally ambiguous, the instructions that you get given. I mean, both, you know, I've been given instructions from tutors and from directors, which are equally uh, ambiguous. And of course, as a young actor or a young student you, you, you nod yes that you understand because you don't want to seem to be be stupid or, or, or not to understand but when they say things like you know kaleidoscope it um, which wasn't said to me but to a colleague of mine or be more believable you know what's be more believable actually mean um, you know one person might believe it another person won't you know be less actory it's another thing what, what does that actually mean I mean okay I'm not I'm not I, I have an impression of it, but it's not very specific. You know, stuff like live it. Um, I think I saw the director say, you know, it needs more Scottish mist. And the young actor said, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know what you mean. Really? <laughs> I didn't. But anyway, um, so you can see the problems there that exist. And that's why I think for me, the science of acting kind of blew my socks off a little bit because I'd been in that world of ambiguity. And uh, I'm not sure why, but I've always liked finding out about things. I kind of think that it's, you know, I just want to understand everything and, wanna, and I ask questions a lot. I think we naturally do that as kids and, and to hold on to that ability is a good thing, I think. Um, and so I'd, I'd always be asking questions and uh, I think I got to a point with some drama training where you kind of go, you know, you're told don't ask questions, so you stop doing it. And then I came across Science of Acting, and it was all about asking questions, you know, and don't stop asking questions and keep finding out. And it was like a massive uh, um, eye-opener. I thought, wow, yeah, okay, that sounds great. And the more I studied it, and the more questions were asked, and the, and the, and, and the answers were given, the more I thought, yeah, I always knew that, but I just, you know, I just didn't, I, I kind of just wanted to ignore it because I just wanted to get on and, and uh, get out there and become an actor and see what it's all about. It was uh, a very enlightening uh, time in my life, the four years I spent at the, at the school, and uh, the School of Science of Acting. And I, I meant to say at the beginning of this stream, I was going to say, I'm, I'm going to give you an overview of, of the Science of Acting in a, f in a few words, and then you'll see 
how impossible it is to really kind of give you any, any more than a fraction of it in, in this in this uh, live stream. That is, I think, the science of acting is pr probably the most comprehensive, conscientiously considered body of knowledge ever developed for acting and directing. That's what I'd say about it. Of course, I don't know every technique out there, but uh, I know quite a few of them. So the science of acting, in the, you know, it kind of flies in the face of conventional drama training, if you want to call it that, is based on instructions that are clear and definable. Okay, there's no ambiguity. Clear and definable. And answers to questions are concise, clear, there's no ambiguity. And you're encouraged to ask questions. And actually, the science of acting is based on four principles. The next video I'm going to do, or the first video, because this is a stream, I've, I've kind of chucked myself in the deep end here, is going to be about the four principles uh, that the science of acting is based on. And I think, I think like all acting drama training should be based on it. I think I'm going to call it the four principles that all acting training should be based on. But I'll tell you two of them in this video, and then the other two you have to you have to watch um, in the next one. So hopefully you'll have subscribed and, and pressed the bell, and, and uh, you'll uh, you'll you'll catch that video as well. But one of the principles was the meaning of words. The words that we used in, in during the training at the Science of Acting, the terminology used in the profession, it had to be clearly defined so that everyone had a common understanding of it, so that everyone knew what each other was were, were talking about. And a great example of that is the word emotion. If you went out into the street or, or went into, I don't know, uh, a place where actors hang out, ask them, you know, for a definition of the word emotion, I think you'd get 10 different answers. You know, they wouldn't be consistent. But yeah, emotion is used a lot in the acting industry um, by actors, directors. It's used a lot. And no one really has a common understanding of it. And you kind of think, but that's not right, surely that's not right. Not just the word emotion, all the, all the terminology used in the science of acting is clearly defined. So emotion, just so you, you know, the definition of that word was the biophysiological result of a thought. An emotion is a, a biophysiological result of a thought. And Sanders didn't pluck it out of the, out of the air. How he got to that um, definition was just asking questions about emotions. You know, how many are there? Do they have different strengths? You know, how long do they last? And the more questions he asked, the closer, closer he got to a definition until he arrived at the final definition. And I think that that's a pretty clear definition that everyone can understand. The biophysiological result of a thought. So that's one of the principles that the science of acting is based on. And one of the things that I remember thinking, yeah, that's kind of refreshing. And, um, and I can kind of do something with that. You know, I can, without this ambiguity, if I'm getting points of reference, remember we talked about points of reference with gravity being a point of reference, all of a sudden you're getting points of reference in a world that doesn't really have them. And, um, and that, was a, that was a life changer for me, a, a game changer. And also, if you have points of reference, you know when you're improving, you, know, if you, 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 can, you can build your, your skill. It gives you a profession. Without them, you can't have a profession if you don't if you don't have any points of reference to be able to judge how your skill is developing and how you're improving then you don't have a profession before i went to the school i was you know doing my best as an actor i was, I was pretty successful i was doing greece in the west end and i was playing kanicki uh, uh, there and and i remember i had um I, I had some agents coming in i wanted to get a new agent and so i think i wrote to 10 3 kane on the night they came, of course, you want to do your best. And for me, I already had met Sam at, at Mountview and knew a bit. And I thought, well, you know, I know a bit about that. But, you know, I'll just go off and be successful and get wealthy and be famous and all this. And, you know, I won't need it. And I was successful, but I could see that without having proper training and, and points of reference and, and the profession, it, it was meaningless. So I ended up going back to the school. But when I was, when I was doing this anyway, back to that story, and I was on stage and um, the, the agents were there, of course... I thought the best job I thought I could do was to, to think the thoughts of the character. We'll get on to what acting is and what character is in a minute, but I thought I've got to think the character's thoughts, but of course agents are in the audience and they came on three separate nights and each time they were there, all I could think about was the agent, where they're sitting, do they like me, are they impressed by me, are they going to sign me, and you know, any thoughts that Kanicki had in the context of the show just went out the window. So I, after every perfor performance I was very depressed. Um, because I thought I'd done a bad job but each one of those three agents that came to see it all wanted to take me on now they have their own reasons you know c commercial 
kind of viability of, of, of me as an actor and and things like that and I, I get completely get that but I'm not talking about them it's about me and I didn't feel fulfilled I felt pretty pretty down and I thought that I can't go on like this you know even if I get a fantastic job job after job you know an actor's job is to hold the thoughts of the character on the stage and if I can't do that what am I doing so that's when I decided I'm going to go back and train um, with Sam at the school and that's what I did before I went there when I used to say to people I'm an actor I used to cringe you know I'm an actor you know because um, I didn't really know what I was doing um, and after studying there at the School of Science Acting for four years and teaching there as well I forgot to mention that, that I do teach I've got a profession and uh, and I feel I know so much about it and, and I'm finding out more about it all the time and that's important because your profession is 70% of your life and you know whatever it is the more you know about it and of course the more fulfilled the more of a fulfilled life you're going to have so let's get on to um, acting and um, what acting is acting if you've ever considered it if you're an actor or you want to train to be an actor if you ever thought what actually is acting really in its most you know fundamental form acting is creating a character that's it the purpose of an actor is to create a character so what's a character um, well a character is a collection of experiences okay a collection of experiences what makes me different from you is that you've had different experiences than I've had in your life um, and these experiences they're stored in your head as thoughts in my head too as, as thoughts and there they are, they're not just like filed away and just stay still in, in, on their shelves. They also interact, all these thoughts interact constantly with each other and this process is going on there that you get to talk about and know about the more, the more in detail you get into the science of acting. So a character's a collection of experiences which are stored in our head as thoughts and as pictures and impressions. So for instance, I have my experiences, you have yours, Hamlet has his experiences and that's what make us all different you know how you your day up until now um, is different from my day up until now you've had different experiences um, so how do we act to act a character we just have to get their experiences and put them in our heads and, and think them I'm Hamlet if I have his experiences so how do we get them in our heads um, okay so let's do a little exercise this exercise if you imagine that you've come to the stream to watch today you know nothing about me and then just before you came on someone called you or you, you met someone they said oh you know that guy he's uh, Philip Alcock he's you know he, he beats his his wife he's known to have beaten his wife and hits his kids and uh, he's a pretty bad guy he's been to um, you know he's violent and he's been in prison for it and just if you think that for a minute and then just sit and look at me okay and now forget that and now if you imagine that before you got to the stream today and you were watching me you were told by somebody just before you came on on, on to watch that I was a, a really good guy I do a lot of work for charity I've helped people all over the world saved thousands of lives and you know I just I just want to help people all the time and if you just hold that in your head and look at me okay that's an exercise called sin and virtue and you probably noticed that when you were looking thinking those different things about me it prompted different feelings towards me um, you know you might have been angry when you were thinking about the fact that I hit hit my wife, hit my, my children, um, you might have um, been, w when, when you thought about me doing a lot of charity work, you might have had warm feelings of me, feelings of belonging, of thinking that I'm, I'm a nice guy. And these feelings uh, really are a result of uh, mental pictures and impressions that you created that led to emotions. You were having different emotions when you were thinking these different things. And what this exercise does, it illustrates the role of imagination and how imagination um, creates these mental pictures and impressions. 
and imagination is very important as a, for an actor as, and a free imagination is very very important and there will be a video I'm going to do a lot of videos about um, the different things that Science of Acting covers imagination is one of them it'll probably take more than one video to cover it um, but yeah of course a free imagination is, is very very important so if a character is so you can see how we get these experiences in our heads or uh, how we get these I mean really what you did with the sin and virtue was acting there you you were using your imagination and you were creating pictures and impressions in your head that led to you having emotions um, and, and and if you can also see as well a lot of people think acting is like you know forcing um, uh, imagination you have to force yourself to think about things forcing the emotions and stuff you didn't do any forcing it was very ethereal you just sat there holding the thoughts I was telling you to hold and the result was different emotions hopefully in, in most of you um, and that's how acting should be a very ethereal um, imagination it, it, it shouldn't ever be forced it should be free and that will be explained I say in, in a, another up and coming video so um, yeah why do we have different experiences then what makes us uh, choose different experiences why do we do things differently you know my breakfast I choose chose different experiences to you you know I'm, I had an egg and bacon sandwich you might have had cereal I don't know but you chose different experience experience experiences than I did um, and you know that I mean why do we do that we all want to be loved we all want to be liked we all want to belong um, be rich some of us um, we do we have these wants in common but some of them are more important to some people than other people and it's this variation in in what we want that leads to our the experiences that we we choose and um, it gives us different personalities so the variation in wants our variation in what we want leads to us having different personalities uh, an example of that if you've got an old lady crossing the road and one person will choose to help her uh, they're choosing one experience and that might be uh, they want to have peace of mind so they will help the old lady across the road if they go past without helping her they, they wouldn't have peace of mind so to have peace of mind they help the old lady across the road another person might just walk past carry on walking because they're going to work they're due a promotion and they want to get there on time they don't want to be late and their purpose might be I, or their want might be I want to succeed uh, I want to succeed and then someone else might choose to mug the old lady and that would be a different purpose that would be a different choice of experience um, and that purpose would be to lose themselves from the guilt and shame of, of uh, doing something like that um, it doesn't have to be those purposes but those are just examples so our experiences you can see that the, each of those three people have different experiences but the experiences were dictated by what they wanted they were dictated by I already said the word but by their purposes okay so this is what gives us our personality it was what defines us from the outside and because that's the case with us it's the same with characters so if we know a character's experiences we can work out their wants their purposes and then we can act the personality that the director requires us to have on stage so that sounds fairly simple we know the experiences we know their purposes simple so why doesn't everyone do it um, because I don't think everyone does do it and it's a good question and then we get onto this thing which this is another mind-blowing thing about quality of acting so if you're gonna teach someone to act I mean I went to, I, you don't go to drama school you don't or really ideally you wouldn't go to drama school just wanting to learn how to act okay you want to learn how to go to act really well um, not just okay so the people that are teaching you how to act surely have to have um, an idea of the quality of acting they are aiming for but that isn't always the case and um, it's certainly uh, I don't think was well, again we're getting down to people's different opinions and saying things that are ambiguous um, you know I've, I, I've had experiences where I've been told you know as I said be more believable be more real but 
what does that really mean? Um, and this is where I was going to get into the ratio rectangle that I put in the um, that I put into the uh, teaser. So what I'll do is I'm just going to go into my desktop here. Um, this is where I'm kind of uh, I get a little bit uh, nervous <laughs> about whether this is all going to work. And uh, I'm going to launch this the the ratio rectangle video. And I'm going to full screen and play it. There we go. So this is the ratio rectangle video. This is a slide down version, of course. Oops. Sorry. Right. So there's the rectangle. And on one side, we've got personal feelings. So, and this ratio rectangle is the ratio rectangle of opinions. So we've got opinions based on personal feelings, which I think what, what I was mostly experiencing earlier on in my, in my drama training. And then we've got opinions that are based on knowledge. Um, which is certainly, when I went to the School of the Science of Acting, that's certainly what the case was. Um, that was more based on, on knowledge than on personal feelings. So the line here that I'm going to draw, um, the dotted line, this is an opinion based, what, probably 90% on personal feelings and 10% on knowledge, which if you're teaching something, that's not ideal. But at the other end, that, that dotted line I just drew, Near the knowledge side, that's you know ninety percent knowledge, ten percent personal feelings, and you want to be teaching or you want to be being taught much much more on the side of knowledge than on the side of personal feelings. I think that's pretty obvious. So um, I could, sorry I could have made it, made that clearer with my cursor there, but hopefully that's clear. Personal feelings, knowledge, opinions, and so that's a rather neat model just explaining. Um, definitely two different styles of teaching that I've, I have encountered probably um, maybe you have too so let me minimise that and get back to um, to the screen, hang on a sec bear with me here um, right uh, there we go, right, okay so the quality of acting, yeah, what are the quality of acting we're aiming for in the pr profession. Um, that really, every drama, everybody teaching drama should know that. There's someone knocking at the door, I don't believe it. <laughs> yeah, I think it's a, um, a book I'm being delivered. <laughs> I can't believe it, they've had all day. Um, okay, um, right. Hopefully they'll just leave it and go. Right, how many how many good actors are there? If you had a room of ten people, um, and you asked them, you know, who do you think is a good actor? People would come up between between five and ten names. There'd probably be a lot of repeated names, and you might end up with thirty, maybe forty people, forty actors that they would consider as good actors. But you know, there's hundreds and thousands of actors, and um, you know, rather than just yeah, sorry, can you just leave it outside, please? Just leave it on the deck there. Thank you. Sorry about that. I'm really sorry. <laughs> that never happens to these pros on YouTube. Anyway, I live on a boat, so that's why um, I'm saying leave it on the deck and stuff. Okay bit of editing work to do there. All right, let's get back to um, what I was saying. Yeah, so there's hundreds of thousands of actors. Surely, you know, it should be some, there'd be more than just 40 good actors. And how many times you've been and see, uh, seen a play and you come back from the play, you come home and you think everybody on stage did a really good job? Not very often, I'd, I'd hazard a guess. I might be wrong, but um, certainly not many for me. So why aren't all the actors good? Because it's not that they don't want to be good. All actors want to be good. They wouldn't be out there going, I'm going to go and do a bad job. But of course they want to do a good job. Um, well, let's look at it from another point of view. Um, when it comes to the quality of acting we'd like to see. What's the ideal acting that you'd like to see? Um, and this is something that Science of Acting uh, was establishes. And it's, it's actually another one of the four 
um, four paths to the science of acting. They're called the four paths to the science of acting. The four principles, as I talked about earlier. What's the quality of acting that you want to see? Well, if you can, if you remember ever seeing watching people that didn't know you were watching them, it's pretty fascinating because they behave without censoring their thinking. They don't know you're watching them, so they're not thinking about you. And they're living their lives and you're just free to sit there and think whatever you want to think and watch them and it's quite nice pretty fascinating so this is probably if you wanted to, to put an ideal um set an ideal for acting that probably be it you know actors living on stage or on film or tv or whatever the medium is the life of the character as though they're not being observed as if they're unobserved so and, and I'm sure you've gone to the theatre and you, you you wanted to experience that at the theatre. You know, you wanted the, the curtain to open and just watch the lives of the characters in the context of the play and the story unfold in front of you while you sit there and watch and be entertained. But you're disappointed because some of the actors, sometimes all of the actors, are thinking more about the audience than they are about the play. Their thoughts are more on the audience. They've got more actors' thoughts than they have characters' thoughts. Um, you know they want to impress the audience and of course that that as well that involves your thinking they want to influence your thinking when you should be just sat there free to think what you want to think rather than having to be impressed or 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 feel that you have to like um you know certain actors up there um have you ever been yourself on stage or in front of a camera and you've been trying to think keep yourself in context but just all you can have in your head is thinking about people watching you I know that I certainly have. Um, so, yeah, it, and what we're talking about is having more actors' thoughts than characters' thoughts because you're thinking about the audience, the actors on stage, you want to impress the audience, they're thinking more about the audience. If the ideal is for characters to be acting as unobserved, you can see this doesn't work if you're thinking about the audience. You have to have more characters' thoughts than you do actors' thoughts to keep you in the context of the story. That's... Um, that's what you should have and so what prevents an actor from doing this you know you, you often hear that <clears throat> oh you know it was it was much better in rehearsal and you know that's something I've, I've heard a lot um, and something I, I've said sometimes and do actors want to mess it up no they don't they don't want to mess it up in performance as opposed to rehearsal but what is stopping them from doing the job that they consciously want to do on stage they wanted to do a good job they couldn't do it something's getting in the way you could say it's nerves yeah nerves get in the way but nerves just don't get there by themselves nerves are a result of something that we're thinking so if we're consciously thinking about doing a good job but nerves are preventing us that why are the nerves being generated i think i just said it it's because of something we're thinking and these thoughts we can't see so what are these thoughts that are preventing us from acting well? Well, before we get on to that, let's just say, do, do you have an impression that there's thoughts in your head that you can't see? Uh, I remember when I was first asked that question, definitely I, there were. Um, we can have some other examples of, of, um, of thoughts that you can't see and, and, uh, and kind of a proof of their existence is do you, if you're on your own do you notice sometimes your mood changes for no reason you, there's no nothing happens nothing changes in the physical world but your mood changes do you do this um where you make a decision you go right okay today um, I, i've been eating chocolate non-stop today i'm going to eat uh, uh when i go to the news agents i'm not going to buy any chocolate um i'm stopping with the chocolate and then you go to the news agents, you buy a paper, and just as you're out to pay, you, you pick up a Mars bar and, and, and have that as well. So you've made a conscious decision not to eat chocolate, but you break it. I mean, it can be the same with watching TV, you know, going to the gym, these things. It's a conscious decision that you've made, but you don't stick with it. So what is stopping you from doing that? And also, there's another example. If you do things, you see things in your parents that you, you that you, you didn't like as a child growing up. You thought, oh, you know, when I grow up, I'm not going to do that, but you end up doing it. Or you do something and you have no idea why you do it, why you've done it. Or you say something you've no idea why you said it. 
So it seems that there's uh, some, thing, some thinking there that we can't see, but it's um, running, running our lives a bit, or a lot. Um, yeah, the common factor seems it's thinking that's there in our heads that we can't see, but it's running our lives. It's, it has a, a very important influence on our lives. And this thinking, uh, in science of acting terms, is called invisible thinking. And this was another thing that completely hooked me about this technique, because it's uh, the more you find out about it, the more you kind of go, yeah, why has no one ever been talking about that in acting training before? Uh, and I started training with Sam in 1994. Was it 94? Um, no, no, not 94, 98. Sorry, 98. Um, but you kind of think, why Why has never, no one ever talked about that before, invisible thinking? Because if we have invisible thinking, it means the character's having invisible thinking. And it's very important because it has a huge influence on our lives. Now, if we go back to the actor who's getting nervous and, you know, does well in rehearsal but can't recreate it in performance, uh, what thoughts might they be having? Invisible thoughts might they be having? What sort of thoughts that might be? Well, there's a thought that people are judgmental. It's quite a common thought. And if you have this thought that people are judgmental, whenever you go on stage, of course, you're going to be thinking, what are the audience thinking about me? And it's that fear of what people are thinking about you that of course makes you nervous and when you have fear can you think easily no fear definitely gets in the way of creativity and one of them one of the things that science of acting does is it it gives you the means to be able to find out in what your invisible thinking is and to get rid of it um, and so you don't have thoughts about the audience in this particular example. And if you don't have thoughts about the audi audience, you're going to have more thoughts in the context of the character. If you've got more thoughts in the context of the character, then the more you'll be um, acting as though you're unobserved and the better the quality of acting is going to be. And if the quality of acting is good, then you've got a solid profession not something that works every now and again. I, th I remember very much this impression when I, before I trained at the Science of Acting, I'd have good performances and bad performances and I never knew why. It was a bit luck of the draw. And, um, and I think uh, Ellen Terry and, uh, I can't remember the name now, Maisie something, um, actresses, both said um, acting is... Uh, is it, I, I think it's art arrived by design or acting right I think it's art arrives by design I have to check that um, or it could have been Gordon Craig who's Ellen and Terry's son but theatre practitioners that are very well respected uh, all talk about um, being able uh, that the art is, isn't just something that, that just happens or acting isn't something that good acting isn't something that just happens by chance you have to be able to recreate it. That's an actor that's doing a very good time after time after time. And if you don't have these invisible thoughts about the audience, then you will be able to stay in the context of the character. You will be able to do a good job as an actor and you will um, have a profession. Um, and then finally, um, why be an actor? Um, why be an actor? Why learn to act? You know, I mean, there's some fundamental reasons we're put on earth and nature puts us here. Um, you know, and we have to do some things to ensure the, the, the survival of the human race. But what do we do the, with the rest of the time that we have on our, our hands? What do we do with ourselves? Well, of course, 70% of what we do is our profession. And acting is a fantastic profession because you spend your entire working life finding out about how other people live, about the professions they have. And a life spent finding out is an extremely fulfilling one and that's why acting and directing and teaching um, teaching acting um, is, is the most fulfilling job you can have and why I enjoy it 
Um, and that's I think that got to the end of what I was going to say. I think I think there was a quote I was going to end with, which is Leonardo da Vinci. Vinci, another quote from him, is the noblest pleasure in is the joy of understanding. And that's the thing that I think the science of acting brings to as, as a as a technique and um, this body of knowledge that's been developed for drama training is that it absolutely encourages questions, encourages finding out on a non-stop basis and that's why I absolutely uh, relished every moment I spent um, studying it and relish now every moment I spend acting, directing, finding out about characters, about the way people live and hopefully uh, you'll have got some information from this um, this stream that uh, will inspire you a little bit to find out more and I'm going to do loads more um, videos here on this channel this is the first thing I've done I've, I, as I said I've really chucked myself in the deep end I didn't kind of realize it when I started doing it and you know all the software involved in this and hardware and and the fact it's really weird normally I'm talking to a classroom of people but I'm, I'm uh, on a camera but hopefully there's some there's some chat we can do now and some um, some q and a if I bring up that um, leave it on the deck <laughs> right I'm, I'm just looking at the at the um, at the uh, at the comments thank you so much for joining me Joaquin I have to thank Joaquin personally because it was doing a stream with him and an interview with him some of you might have seen it he's a fellow actor from the King and I we were having a lovely time doing that on tour and then COVID happened um, but Joaquin was a fantastic inspiration behind um, me actually taking the jump to doing this um, and he's been very supportive so big thanks to him um, I hope you've learned something and now I have to make sure that I, I ask this question if you want to win the book Joaquin can't enter so at the moment it looks like um, there's not going to be much uh, competition for it but what I'm going to do is a bit of um, a bit of uh, yeah there you go um, this is the email address you send the, the answer to so all I want to know is the answer is, is the question is what year was Sam Kogan born and where was he born um, I'll give you a clue there's a Wikipedia article and if you send that to this email address that's scrolling across the bottom of the screen um, Philip Wilcock press at yahoo.co.uk and what I'll do I'll just um, you know I'll put the names in a, in a hat and get my my um, my son to pick one out my wife to pick one out and whoever gets that I'll um, you'll have to I'll, I'll email you and, and ask you for your address and then I'll send it to you at your address or wherever you want to get it and that's it so any questions at all um, or is everyone just uh, just uh, kind of it's quite a lot of information so I might have, I might have overdone it there I might have been a bit um, a bit too much but uh, you've got to start somewhere um, Sam thanks for joining me Neil uh, um, Kim Joaquin of course I've mentioned thanks a lot for being here and um, you know those of you that, that missed it hopefully you're catching up on the the, the um, I'll, I'll edit this and I'll put it on as, as a video I'm going to stream Joaquin I'm going to stream and answer your question I'm going to stream I think just to get better at it I think I'm going to try and do it um, probably every couple of weeks I think the live stream the videos the uploading the videos I'm going to do one a week it's easier for me to upload the videos to find the time to stream at the right time because I picked this time because you know I was being really grand and thought people would be watching in uh, uh, might want to watch in, in different countries I don't think that's the case but I didn't really advertise it very well because I knew it was it was the first one um, but you know, I'm, I, did all the tech work? Can someone just answer me? Did it all? Did the intro work? Did you hear the music? Um, is this is the thing scrolling across the bottom? Just, 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 uh, just give me a comment and let me know if that's uh, if it if it worked. And the book is a great book. What I'll do as well is if you keep in touch with me, whoever gets the book. Oh, Germany! Someone from Germany! Brilliant. Kim, Kim's in Germany. Thanks for joining us, Kim. Um, if you win the book 
Oh, good question from Sam. I'll answer that in a minute, Sam. If you win the book, there's a couple of things in it that need a bit of annotation because they weren't they weren't done correctly. It needs a second edition. So what I'll do is I'll send you those notes to go with it, um, so that you you've um, you've got them, and uh, and those corrections have been made. Here, Sam asks, what was it like working with Christopher Nolan? Yeah, it's uh, it was. Yeah, it was a, a, a great experience, actually. He's someone that, um, you know, he just has the whole film in his head. He's, he thinks about it, it a lot and has every detail. He's, he's a real stickler for details, and I applaud that in anyone. Uh, I think the work he does is extremely conscientious, and um, and as a director, um, it, it's a little bit... At that, at, that, at that kind of level, you're a bit kind of... Uh, removed from the director which is a shame um you know unless you're the star you know unless you're the big stars who you get to rehearse and work with them a lot i think the the closest i got to him was probably in the audition and it was just myself the casting director and him i think and an assistant and he gave me the direction that he wanted to give me in the in the audition i did it the way he wanted and and then i think he just knew i was going to do it the way he wanted on set so we didn't really speak that much on set um, you know, it's a massive undertaking doing a film of that scale. Although it, it did, it almost had a student student film feel to it. To be honest, in so, in some aspects, which was quite 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 weird. It was very relaxed, but also as well when you see sets being changed and you know the bat pod being like brought onto set, and it literally happens in two seconds because the the crew guys on these kind of films are like ninjas, and uh, they get paid a fortune and deservedly so because they make things happen in seconds it, it's it's um it's crazy interesting um so we've got that um thanks for hitting subscribe joaquin and for the bell that's great uh thanks for letting me know it's all working kim and i hope you're well in germany i lived in germany for a while i don't know if you know that um i did a show out in germany i, I learned to speak german i've done a few german characters um which i really enjoyed although it's always a bit challenging in, in a different language um thanks Neil it is a good book and uh, I'll send the annotation um, to you as well if you just send me an email at that same address and I'll send the annotation to you too so you've got that um, I'm planning to do uh, other things as well that I can um, you know giveaways and stuff uh, on further videos and there will be a lot of them I, I think you know it's taken me a long time to do this but there are um, there, there's so much information there's so much knowledge to be shared and you know i'm not saying this is the definitive place to get it at all by watching my videos but it, hopefully it'll just make you think about it and and if you want to pursue um you know further workshops or training there's a school of the science of acting um in archway uh i do private lessons again if you if you're interested in doing private study with me just let me know email me um obviously at the moment it'll all be by zoom Right, I'm just looking at there's some more questions coming in. Uh, Kim, you're talking about characters, a collection of experiences. I was thinking experiences and the conclusions you draw from them. Yeah, that's right. It's, it, yeah, it, the conclusions you draw from them really result in your purposes, and it's that's what I was saying about the 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 experiences you have, the the thoughts all go into your head and and they interact with each other. Crudely speaking, as processes go on there, and you make decisions um, based on those experiences. And um, and that's how you make decisions and choose your purposes. Your purposes are based on, on the experiences that you've had. But I have to say that all this is, is pretty isolated information on its own. There's a lot more. There's a lot more to it than that, because we haven't talked about something called mind erosion, which is a pattern of thinking and patterns of thinking that are pretty stuck in our in our consciousnesses. Um, it's just that that, that that is a big factor in why, you know, how we choose our purposes, the conclusions that we draw from our experiences. Um, and I'll talk about mind erosion. That's another video. Wow, there's a lot of videos. Um, act, acting opposite Heath Ledger must have been interesting, though. Yeah, it, it was. He was. You know, I think the I think the main thing about that was. Um, I think he was. Uh, he he wanted to do a really really good job um of it of of every take he did um i remember in the scene that i did with him he did a lot of takes 
and I think they said that we that after the third take they had it but he wanted to do it again and again and he really wanted to um, to find the, the take that he was satisfied with although I don't know if he ever was and um, you know I don't know if um, yeah I mean, of course, that performance has been lauded as, as one of the best performances of that character has been. I think loads of people consider it as being one of the best performances of the Joker. Um, but I remember just feeling this... Um, um, yeah, I was never sure if he was quite satisfied with it. Um, I think that was the, that was the main impression. Um, and I wish I'd talked more with him, of course, because, you know wasn't long after that and then uh, he passed away but um i was too busy sitting there going oh my god <laughs> i'm on this i'm on this set doing this film and um yeah sometimes i was like that a lot of the time i wasn't because i was just thinking about the character to be honest i was i was sat there thinking i just have to think the character's thoughts i just have to stay in contact with the character i just have to do my job and i was able to do my job i think i think um if you watch it hopefully you'll agree um uh, how did you find working on Jersey Boys? A lot of stamina with the intensity of the tours. Yeah, Sam, it was... Um, Jersey Boys was a fantastic experience. Theatre is different than film because you get a lot longer to work on a character. You get to develop it throughout the run. I did Jersey Boys for two years. I think the first year was probably creatively, for me, the best one because I was still inspired. And when it got into the second year, I could see the show kind of... Probably things that people wouldn't have, have noticed at, unless you'd been in it from the start but I could see the show declining a bit around me and and rather than staying inspired which I should have done I started to get a little bit um, I don't know what a bit um, a bit uninspired I guess a bit kind of um, which 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 wasn't right you've got to, inspiration is very important for an actor but the length of time doing it certainly the, the first year was, was great because you get to work on a character all the time you get to think about it all the time you know, I think any single character that you play, you could spend a whole lifetime developing it, and um, you know, and still, you know, and more. It, you can just work on one character for, for for a very long time if you know what you're doing and you know how to work on it. Um, was are there any techniques you use in particular to keep your voice in good shape for roles such as Jersey Boys, or any you would suggest for building your voice? Uh, you have to ask my wife. She's a, she's a voice teacher, um, so she'll be able to help you with that. Um, no, I, I warmed up every day. Uh, there was a compulsory warm up on the King and I. There's a compulsory warm up, even though I didn't sing and I always did it. Um, I think warm ups are, are, are good to do. I used to do a lot of. Um, I'm talking about the King and I now, but I used to do a lot of uh, um, articulation exercises because I was speaking in. Um, RP received pronunciation for that um, and that helped a lot um, with Jersey Boys we had a dialect coach as well and, um, and like I say but we had you know the, the musical director made sure we did vocal warm-ups and um, and that was that was all, always kept my voice in check I remember I was in the dressing room next to Ryan Malloy who played Frankie and he he warmed up uh, like diligently every show and and we he, he he did the one I think he did the one on stage, but he also did his own one, uh, and he did a warm down as well after the show, and he never missed it, and he's got a pretty stunning voice. So I think that's it. Uh, any more questions? Um, I think it's coming up to an hour mark. Um, I'll uh, I'll hang on a bit if there's any more, um, and if any, anybody in the in the comments. You know anything you want to know about specifically, or um, I, I, one thing I was thinking. I don't know if there's any any anybody who watched this. Is that I know Sam taught. Uh, he was a guest teacher at Mount View. He taught at Olra as well, and I think he taught some other places. But I'm not sure. It'd be good to find out where those places were. Um, anything else? I don't know. I don't think so. But thank you for joining me in this first live stream. Uh, I've really uh, en enjoyed it, and um, and hopefully from the, from the feedback, you've enjoyed it as well and got some useful information from it. Don't forget to keep uh, to subscribe and and to come back for more videos. As I say, the next one will be I'm pretty sure the four 
principles that all acting training should be based on. You've had two of them here, the quality of acting, um, you know, knowing what quality of acting that you're aiming for and uh, meaning of words, very important. And, um, and then um, there's another two that I'll give you in that video. And, and it's crazy that, you know, that it isn't just a gen, you know, all acting training isn't, isn't done like that, but hey. Okay, um, so it, without any more, I'm gonna sign off. I don't have an end screen or anything. You know, you see these YouTube guys and they have end screens and fancy things, I don't. So everyone got the email address, yeah. Um, hopefully I've got some emails there and uh, with some answers and I'll be sending that book out to one a, a lucky winner and uh, have a read of it it's fascinating I think Neil's already got it um, and yeah it's a five star review on Amazon and um, yeah, a cracking cracking book and a cracking technique um, it, it doesn't really the the book again it's it's a it's a representation of the technique you know it, it's nothing like studying it for four years um but um it's a start and hopefully these videos will be a start and uh and any workshops that you find out about that are available or classes um are certainly a, a, a good way to to start um accruing knowledge of this amazing technique okay thanks very much for joining me have a lovely weekend and um and I'll see you on the next one.